Well, folks, I don't even know what to say. I have been so busy the last couple of days. I've missed so many great stories that I've wanted to talk about. I guess I'm going to have to cram them all in today somehow. Uh, the first thing was Trump's great abortion odyssey. Uh, I, I really, you know, and I really wanted to use that title for a video, but uh, I don't, I don't think I can in this omnibus episode. But yeah, uh, let me just get through that before I, before I get onto anything else. The wild ride that was the 24 hours uh, from uh, Trump declaring that he uh, supported in Florida and that he was pushing for this personally uh, to legalize abortion up until the point of birth, uh, and after you know campaigning on saying you know hey you know we we got roe v wade's it's uh, overturned this is great we sent abortion back to the states this is something that should be um decided at the state level a perfectly reasonable and defensible position you know he stepped on the rake of saying like well i think that florida is way too restrictive on uh, on abortion and we need it legal up until the point of birth and i know he didn't use those exact words but he said hey i, I support the ballot measure which would legalize abortion up until the point of birth. And that pissed off a lot of people because, uh, you know, it's one thing for Trump to say, hey, we should leave this up to the states and say, I'm not going to get involved with the abortion politics. I'll leave that up to the lower levels. I'm running to, you know, uh, lead the federal government. And the federal government is not involved in this and shouldn't be involved in this. It's a really divisive issue. It should be decided, uh, you know, at a lower level of government. You know, but then he goes and puts his finger on the scales. Now, again, he was prompted to do this by an NBC reporter. This is the defense saying, you know, oh, but they – NBC asked him about abortion. It's like, okay, but you should be prepared if you're a presidential candidate to be able to speak about one of the top wedge issues in America. Like you need to be really solid on your messaging on that, especially this is a week after we had Trump's VP candidate, J.D. Vance, go in a sit-down interview and, and make a promise to the pro-choice community that Trump would veto at the federal level any restrictions on abortion. And you know what? Yes, that's consistent with the whole, you know, hey, federal government shouldn't be involved. But, you know, if you're going to do that, and you're going to make all these concessions to the pro-choice people and say, hey, the federal government's not going to restrict abortion at all, uh, then you you can't then go to a pro-life state uh, or a state that has a, a general – and that's not even a pro-life state, geez. I mean it, the, the Florida law is just so not um, – it should be so – it's so milquetoast you know, by like world standards. Like I think it's still on average like more liberal than most of Europe uh, on abortion, the law that we have here. It's like six weeks, you know. Like I'm sorry. If you have unprotected sex and six weeks is not long enough uh, <laughs> to to like fit, to take a pregnancy test, I just – it's very hard for me to have sympathy. Like that's not a big bar to clear. But anyway, Trump comes in. He puts his finger on the scales, um, all, basically sealing the fate of um, the abortion issue in Florida had Trump maintained this position and advocated uh, for uh, passing this amendment, uh, which would make uh, abortion in Florida, in the state of Florida a, uh, a civil right, a constitutional right, it would have certainly passed because Trump is by far the most influential public figure uh, in uh, the state of Florida. He's very popular here. Uh, on you know on a relative basis, I mean Florida has always been pretty polarized. Our elections are pretty close, but um, by Florida standards, Trump wins by pr pretty you know pretty safe margins. <laughs> Winning 53% statewide is nothing to sneeze at, you know, especially for a presidential candidate. So anyway, this pissed off a lot of people. It um, uh, really validated all of the concerns of a lot of the pro-life activists like Lila Rose who said just flat out like, hey, based on everything that Trump has said, uh, I, I can't comfortably support the guy. Uh, it validated a lot of those people's concerns. And I think Trump finally found the limit. I, I, I think this is good. He listened to feedback and he looked at what was going on online and he said, you know what? I think I finally crossed a line here. And so he did a full 180 the next day. And uh, when it comes to politicians, I'm not here to purity test. I'm not here to 
Um, uh, I'm not trying to elect the most virtuous people in America. Like the most virtuous people in America uh, don't even vote for the most part. Uh, And they're certainly not running for political office. So I don't need Trump to be a true believer necessarily, uh, but he needs to not betray his voters and he needs to understand that this is something that his voters care about, even if he doesn't. And he needs to not he needs to not make them feel like he's their enemy and he needs to not be their enemy. And so he did a, a full 180. He said, uh, vote against this amendment. It's way too extreme, uh, which, you know, I mean, should be obviously true. Uh, I think that, uh, you know, Trump was just uninformed. I think he actually was. I think that that is a fair assumption uh, based on the way he talked about the amendment, that he was uninformed on it. And that as soon as he heard the feedback and <laughs> looked into it a little closer, he's like, oh, yeah, I, I can't endorse this. Um which that is the politically smart move. So I think it's fair to chalk that up as a gaffe. Uh, almost immediately afterwards, Trump was sort of uh, doing damage control before the clip even came out. He went out on stage because it was right before he went out on stage to give to do a campaign event. And he said something like, you know, some nasty woman from NBC was asking me some very bad questions, you know, and uh, very dishonest, misleading you know, he was like already distancing himself from the interview uh, before it aired. And so, um, <clears throat> like we know just personally, yeah, Trump's a pro-abortion guy. Uh, we can probably imagine why. But as long as he understands that like he can't lead that way and that, uh, you know, he needs to make nice with the people who feel the opposite, um, uh, I think he'll be okay. You know, I, I, I don't necessarily hate the uh, the federalism argument. I do think that it is purely um, – I, I, I think that from Trump's perspective, it's purely a pragmatic one. I don't think that it's like a principle thing. I don't think that Trump like cares about federalism as a principle. I don't think that he cares about uh, um, uh, subsidiarity, <laughs> you know, the, uh, the term that they use in Switzerland. Uh, I don't think that that's like how he thinks about government. But in his case, he sees this as a very divisive issue. Um, He knows that he's on the opposite side of his voters for the most part. Uh, He also knows that there's a lot of people who he, you know, doesn't want to turn off who think like him, um, you know, who are on the opposite side of the abortion issue. And it really is just uh, easier for him to punt it away. And so if he's going to stake out the neutral position, he needs to stay there, at least at the federal level. And if you're going to speak out on state politics at all, uh, speak out in favor of your actual voters who are the pro-life people. If you're going to sit on the fence, sit on the fence. If you're going to pick a side, side with your people. Like, I don't think it's that complicated. And so for now, a uh, happy ending, I guess I would say. Uh, it, it, it All's well that ends well. Uh, but then pretty quickly, I mean, that like that was that was over the course of a Thursday and then a Friday, like all that happened. Um, but something that had been building, I think it was on Wednesday, maybe Trump went to Arlington National Cemetery for a ceremony honoring uh, people who died in during the uh, evacuation of Afghanistan, a bunch of uh, American soldiers that were killed um, in that process, I believe, at a particular event. Uh, and Trump was in attendance. You know, what? wasn't it on Monday. I think it was I think it was all the way back on Monday. And anyway, the uh, the, the Harris campaign. And uh, the media had slowly, like, they were criticizing Trump a little bit. You know, it's like, oh, he shouldn't have gone. He should politicize that. Um, and then they, they kind of crossed a line uh, to where they, they, they decided to um, implicate the families of these dead soldiers in a political operation. And I don't think that's a smart move because uh, just like it wasn't, uh, you know, it, it wasn't good for Trump in 2016 when they had that uh, uh, that uh, Muslim guy whose son died in Iraq uh, speak at the DNC. <clears throat> like it's not good, generally speaking, politically to have uh, Gold Star families uh, coming out and saying you're a bad person and denouncing you. Like you, you want to avoid that if at all possible. You know, obviously that uh, the Muslim dad at the DNC 
didn't destroy Trump's campaign. Trump still won in 2016. Uh, it's still it's not something that's ever going to benefit you, because generally people's uh, people whose children have been killed in war, like the parents of dead soldiers, they're pretty sympathetic characters. And so even if you disagree with their politics, the average American is not going to look at them and go like, oh, yeah, that person sucks. It's like, oh, I feel bad for you. And so maybe we'll see a bit of a backtrack from the Harris campaign um, going into next week, maybe on the Sunday shows today. I didn't watch them. I should have checked if there was anything important. I mean, but the Sunday shows are fairly irrelevant these days. Um, but, you know, in a, in a presidential election season, you know, they have some utility. And it's not a smart move. Also, there was like this weird tweet, um, which uh, um, I don't think that this is like a bad thing for the Harris campaign necessarily, but just seemed it just seemed kind of silly and something that Tim Pool is going to be able to use to promote himself. Um, they called Tim Pool a Trump operative, and uh, something about how he was plotting like to institute twenty Project Twenty Twenty Five. You know, throw that buzzword in there. Um, and uh, he's promising to file a lawsuit against the Harris campaign for defamation and blah blah blah. And if he actually could, if he if he's able to get like past a motion to dismiss, um, it should be a pretty easy case for him because all he has to prove is that he's not a paid Trump shill. And assuming that he's not a paid Trump shill, uh, like he could have a. He could have a win in court against the Kamala Harris campaign, which would be pretty funny. It'd be a great way to promote your show. Um, like this is, you know, this is like a dream opportunity if you're media personality. Have one of the two presidential candidates, you know, like come out and condemn you directly. Um, yeah. Like the uh, the Kamala campaign getting down in the mud with Tim Pool. Uh, you know, lowering themselves to his level. And I don't say that because they're so great and he's so terrible. I mean, like, because one is a presidential campaign, supposedly someone trying to become the leader of the free world, and the other one is a podcast host. <laughs> you know, it's kind of like when Trump uh, came out and condemned Joe Rogan for, not in, for like, not endorsing him. Uh, and Trump came out and said, like, you know, Joe Rogan sucks. Nobody likes him anymore. It's like, that was just pathetic. <laughs> And so now Harris is having her chance um, uh, to do the same thing, and she picked an like an infinitely smaller, well, I shouldn't say infinitely smaller, but a much more niche, uh, much more, much, much less prominent podcast host in Tim Pool to condemn, you know, over uh, over Joe Rogan. And you know, to be fair to. Trump, at least, I don't think he lied about Joe Rogan. I think he just called him mean names and said nobody likes you because, uh, you, you know, because everyone loves Trump and Joe Rogan doesn't love Trump. So therefore, uh, nobody loves Joe Rogan. That was, the, I believe, the, the, the summary of the tweet. But, you know, the Kamala campaign comes out with this clip of Tim Pool and says, Tim Pool scrubbed this clip from uh, from YouTube because he's afraid of the truth getting out. He, you know, he he slipped up and he and he and he um, uh, spoke about the plan to uh, to implement Project 2025, uh, you know, once uh, once the Trump administration comes in, because uh, Tim Pool's a Trump operative. Uh, so this is an official statement from the Trump campaign, everybody. You know, and additionally, I mean, you keep seeing the Kamala campaign come out at the same time, and she's triangulating hard, it seems, uh, coming out and endorsing the wall and, and other stuff, so endorsing the uh, Trump's plan to get rid of um, income tax for tips. You know, if you're, a, if you're like a service worker, if you're a waiter or a bartender or somebody who gets tips, it seems like everybody wants a tip these days. Oh, and then there was the interview. Oh my gosh, I didn't even, I didn't even have the time to go through the interview. I didn't have the patience to. I mean, the clips were were bad enough. I can't imagine how sitting through the whole thing must have felt, you know. And, and she doesn't have an excuse like Biden, you know, that that she's um, senile. Uh, she's just she's just not good at this. And we knew this. We knew this from the 2016 campaign. She ran for president, uh, or no, it was 2020. She ran for president. She got zero delegates. She got like a, a fraction of a percent of the support in the primary. Um, nobody liked her. She's just not cut out for this 
for the job of campaigning, you know, let alone being president. I mean, once she's in the White House, you know, she can kick back and relax, let everybody else worry about that, let the special interest groups, uh, you know, run everything. That's what presidents normally do. That's what's going on right now with, with Biden. But you have to be articulate enough, you have to be charismatic enough to get through a campaign and convince people that you're some kind of um, – you have to uh, project some sort of leadership persona. So anyway, uh, with that said, uh, I will see you folks back here in the next one.